Well, if you'll take your copy of the scripture this morning and turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're going to be in the final verses of this book this morning in verses 25 through 28. Oz Guinness is someone you may know. Uh, Oz is a Christian author and scholar and apologist, and he has written over 30 books. He's an Oxford-educated man, and he grew up mission, a missionary kid in China uh, during the 40s. And he talks about an experience that he had there as his parents were ministering in the capital city of China, uh, serving in a, in a mission there, things started to get kind of dangerous. And so they sent him, as many missionaries did, uh, they sent him to a boarding school in another city uh, in Shanghai because it was a little safer there. But before they sent him out, they wanted him to remember the gospel training that he had received as a child at their hands. And so his father went out and he found two small, smooth stones. And on each one of these stones, he painted his own personal motto and also the motto of his wife. And, and his motto was, found faithful. And his uh, mother's motto was, please him. Now, he said that during this time, he was there and he kept one stone in his left pocket and he kept the other stone in his right pocket of his gray flannel uniform that he had at boarding school. And, and when he put his hands in his pocket, he would always feel those stones and be reminded that we're to be found faithful and that we're to please him. And they were gospel reminders for him. He said, you know, when Mao Zedong came in and took over uh, the nation of China, he had to leave in a hurry and those stones were lost. Uh, when he had to flee from China. But he said, even today, and, and Oz is still alive today, he's still writing. He said, even today, I remember those two aspects of the gospel, found faithful and please him. And they still are there, even after all this time. He said that followers of Jesus are called to be found faithful and to please him always everywhere and in spite of everyone and everything. Those two little stones were gospel reminders for Oz Guinness. And Paul, here at the end of this letter to the Thessalonian church, is offering a few gospel reminders to that congregation as well. Three very quick reminders to pray, to love, and to study. So will you stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's word this morning? The Apostle Paul closes his first letter to the Thessalonians by writing, Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Father, we are so thankful for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who inspired Paul to pen these words to the Thessalonian church, but not only to them, but to us as well. Father, I pray this morning that as we study this passage, that the Holy Spirit comes and teaches us and opens our hearts and minds to the truth of your word so that we might not only learn it, but that we might apply it in our lives as well and go out from here better stewards of the grace that you have given us in Jesus Christ our Lord. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, as we have been studying through this letter to the Thessalonians, these three themes of pray and to love and to study are themes that we have seen before. And in fact, if you have studied much of Paul at all in his other letters, you'll realize that this is not just unique to the Thessalonian church. These are themes that he has expounded on in his letters to many different churches at many different times. This is, this is it. And the reason why is because he was concerned 
with their spiritual growth. He was concerned with how they were maturing in the faith. He wanted to see them grow stronger with, with the Lord and, and grow stronger in their walk with him. And so here at the end, he gives them these three quick gospel reminders, the first of which is prayer. Now, it shouldn't come as a surprise that prayer is central to Paul. It is at the very heart of who he is and what he has, has done. In fact, in this short letter to the Thessalonians, we've already seen two examples where Paul wrote out prayers that he was praying for the Thessalonian believers. And in other places in this passage, he had been talking about how he had been praying for the Thessalonians already. And, and that's not unusual. In every letter that Paul wrote, every one of them, there is either a prayer that he has written out that he's praying on behalf of the recipients of that letter, or he talks about the contents of what his prayers have been for those people. Prayer is central. It's in every single one of his letters. And he wanted his people, the people that he was writing to, to be a praying people as well. Because he knew the power of prayer. He knew just how life-changing it is. You see, prayer is not only life-changing for the person who's being prayed for. It changes the prayer as well. It, per it changes the person who is praying that it molds us. Just think about the various forms of prayer that there are. Uh, first of all, there's prayers of praise. Whenever we go before the Lord, we should praise Him for who He is. These songs that we sang this morning were like prayers of praise to God about His majesty, about His awesomeness, about His... Uh, he's indescribable, right? Uh, boy, I love that message from from S.M. Lockridge, right, who, who goes on and on and talks about how he's indescribable, but he tells you that in about five minutes. And, and he says, I wish I could describe him to you. Uh, it, it, there's just, it's amazing. That's who he is. But there's also prayers of thanksgiving. There is so much that the Lord does for us every single day that we could spend all our time thanking him for those things. If all we had to thank him for was Jesus, that would be enough for us to thank him forever. But he does so much more through Jesus and for us. And so we have prayers of thanksgiving, of gratitude for him and his providence. There's also prayers of repentance and forgiveness. When we sin, when we turn away from him, when we go the wrong direction and we miss the mark, that's what sin means, missing the mark. When that happens, we repent. We humble ourselves before the Lord and we ask for his forgiveness, knowing that he will give it, knowing that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins if we ask for it. And then there are prayers of intercession where we lift others up before God, asking him to intervene in their lives. Sometimes those are prayers for healing, physical healing. Sometimes they're prayers for spiritual healing. Sometimes there are even prayers of intercession for somebody who you know is trapped in sin and you're asking God to convict them of that sin and, and praying to God that he will bring repentance to them so that they might turn away from it and avoid the disaster and the death that comes with sin. You see, there's not a single aspect of our lives, whether individually or corporately, that is an area where, where prayer is optional. Prayer is not optional. Prayer is something we must do. We must be seeking the will of God to be done here on earth just as it is in heaven, just as Jesus taught us to pray in the model prayer. Prayer helps to mold us to the will of God because when we're praying for it, we'll start to seek after it, not only in the world, but in our own lives as well. And Paul, as he traveled on all of his missionary journeys, he understood just how powerful prayer could be. You know, when I, when I talk about prayer, I'm always reminded of Martin Luther, the great reformer, uh, the, the man who stood and nailed those 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg uh, castle, the church there. And 
Martin Luther understood how important prayer was. In fact, he was known for getting up very early in the morning and spending a couple of hours each day in prayer before he got started. And one day he had a particularly busy day. There was a lot to do. And Luther said, I have so much to do today that I have to get up earlier and spend more time in prayer if I want to get through it all. That's not often our attitude, is it? Sometimes when the, the demands of life press in on us, we say, well, I've got to push prayer off. I, I've got to I got to do, no, 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 we need to be more like Luther. We need to say when we have so much to do in our lives, I got to spend more time in prayer because that's the lifeline to the Father. That's where I hear his direction in my life, and that's where I need to be. That's it. So Paul's gospel reminder for prayer shows us that we, we need to be in prayer, but he also shows us that we need to be praying for others in our lives, especially those who serve in leadership positions. Look at what he said there in verse 25, brothers, pray for us. This is a very short exhortation that Paul gives, brothers, pray for us. He doesn't give a whole lot of specifics here. It's, it's a broad kind of thing. But think about all the things that Paul and Silas and Timothy, who were writing this letter to the Thessalonian church, think of all the things that they had endured. They had gone through terrible treatment in Thessalonica. They were going through terrible treatment everywhere they went. They were being oppressed. They were being imprisoned sometimes. They were being beaten. They were being chased out. They were facing resistance from the Jewish people and the Gentiles. They were shipwrecked. Uh, Paul was even stoned and left for dead. This was a lot of stuff that they were going through. And Paul says, pray for us. There were relationships that needed to be developed in the towns that they went to. And you know what else? There were relationships that needed to be healed as well. Remember Paul and Barnabas? They had a great disagreement, and they split, and they went different ways. Now, that relationship ended up being reconciled, but they knew that there was prayers that were needed. So when we approach the throne of grace in prayer, brothers and sisters, are we lifting others up? Are we lifting up their needs? Are we lifting up the things in their lives that, that need our prayer intercession on their behalf? Prayer works. Prayer works. Just a couple of weeks ago, we were blessed to have someone here at the church who had been on our prayer list for a long time. And she had been facing cancer that was ravaging her body. And she knew that we had been praying for her and praying for her specifically, and, and the elders of the church had been praying for her. And she was here to say, thank you for those prayers. The cancer's almost all gone. There's a little bit still there. But, but that's unbelievable, unless you understand prayer. If you understand prayer, you know that that's common. That's what God can do when the people of God get together and focus on praying for one another. And that's what Paul's calling them to do. Brothers, pray for us. The Thessalonians would have heard that as a prayer request for others. Remember the words of James 5, 6. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. When we're lifting up others in prayer, it makes a difference. And one of the places it really makes a difference is when you're praying for the leadership in the church. You see, those who are spiritual leaders in the church are standing on the front lines of the spiritual battle that we are in. And if you don't believe that we are in a spiritual battle today, then please open a newspaper, turn on the news, do something to see what's happening in this world today. We are in a spiritual battle, and I believe that battle is intensifying. It is getting stronger. But the good news is the battle is already won. Jesus won that battle on the cross, and when he was raised again on the third day, the battle's over. There's still some skirmishes that are being fought. That's going to, okay, but the war has been won. Praise God for that. But those who are in leadership, 
they're out there on the front line, and they're the ones who are taking the most flack, and they're the ones who are meeting the most resistance. They're the ones who are standing by your side when things are going poorly. They're grieving with those who are grieving. They're counseling those who need help. They are holding accountable those who are wandering off the, the path that they should be on, the straight and narrow. That is it. When you are doing all of these things, let me tell you from personal experience, and I know that my brothers Bob and my brother Kirk, they will tell you the same thing. It will wear you down. It will wear you down when you're ministering to people in this way. And here's what happens when a spiritual leader gets worn down. They are far more susceptible to sin. They're far more susceptible to temptation. That happens. But here's a beautiful thing. When Paul says, brothers, pray for us. Pray for us. When we lift up our leaders in our prayers and pray for them regularly, we receive a supernatural strength. It can't be explained apart from God working through the prayers of his people. That is the only explanation it is. And I can tell you from personal experience that I have felt those prayers in moments when, boy, I was getting beat down. It was a tough situation. And all of a sudden, I just felt invigorated. And then later somebody says, hey, brother, I, I don't know why, but you were on my mind. And the Lord led me to pray for you at this time. It was exactly at that time. I had no idea. But, I, boy, I've, I've come to learn that when that happens, there's somebody who's lifting me up in prayer. So I encourage you, keep these leaders lifted up in prayer because each one of them needs to be strengthened in God's service through uh, your intercessions. But I want you to consider the other side of this prayer request for just a moment as well. Now, obviously, the Thessalonians heard this as a request to pray for others. But look at it from Paul's perspective. This was a request to pray for himself. It was a request for himself. Each one of us is in need of prayers from our fellow believers. Every one of us has weak spots and blind spots in our life. And we need to be held up. For them, But you know what ends up happening? Pride gets in the way. We get, we get proud. We want folks to think that we've got it all together. And we don't want those masks that we wear to church on Sunday morning to have any cracks in them or to reveal what's really going on underneath. And so we keep it all inside. And when somebody comes up on Sunday morning and asks, how are you doing? Oh, I'm great. Oh, everything's going just splendid. But you inside, you're crumbling. Inside, you're hurting. Brothers and sisters, we need to ask for prayer for ourselves. That's what this is. Now, in this particular request, Paul doesn't ask for anything in specific. But look at some of his other letters. In Ephesians 6, he asks that church to pray for him that he might speak boldly as he ought to speak. That's what he asked for, specific prayer. In Romans 15, Paul asks them to pray for him that he might be delivered from oppressors in Judea, that he might be able to serve Jerusalem in a, in a good way, and that he might be able to come to Rome to visit these people. See, he gave three specific prayer requests there. And then in Philemon, when he's writing to his friend, he also asks for a specific prayer there too, also to come and visit his friend. He says, pray that, that I might be able to come and see you soon. So there's specific things that we need to ask for. And, and, and Paul was not worried about the people he was writing to seeing him as a weak believer. In fact, Paul typically didn't care what you thought of him. He wasn't worried about that. You read his letters, uh, boy, especially 1 Corinthians. Go in there and take a look at how Paul works his way through that and sees how the Corinthians are looking at him. He doesn't care. He doesn't care about being seen as weak. All he cares about is he knows he needs the prayer support of God's people. And he's going to request it. He's going to ask for it. It's one of the things I love about Wednesday prayer meeting here. People open up and they share their honest prayer requests with one another. They're not worried about prayer meeting being gossip meeting because it's not. 
Prayer meeting is prayer meeting. We share our requests with one another, our personal needs, and we lift them up. And one of the things that they know is that the people who are there are going to pray for them. People are taking notes in prayer meeting. They're writing it down. They're keeping track so that they can keep praying through the week, not just one time on Wednesday evening. So I can't encourage you enough to be at prayer meeting through the week. You need to have that kind of support. And that's what Paul's reminding the Thessalonians and us is just how important prayer is in the life of the believer. Now, the second gospel reminder that Paul offers us is our need to love one another. It's in verse 26. He says, greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. Now, such a command to love one another should not be foreign to our ears, should it, brothers and sisters, because this is something that permeates the entirety of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. It is in there all over the place. In fact, what did Jesus say when he was asked what the greatest commandment was? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then he said, and the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. What's the command? Love. Love God. Love others. That's it okay so you have this focus on love and within the church as a whole there should be such a demonstration of love for one another that it causes the world to stop and take notice not because we like and love people who are like us but because our love for one another covers everybody it covers everyone in the church so what's the meaning of this holy kiss that Paul is talking about? Is he commanding all people in all times to greet one another by kissing them? I don't think so. You see, Scripture's not written in a vacuum. Scripture is written in a context. And we have to understand that context if we want to understand what it is that Scripture is saying. And in the context in which Paul is writing that ancient Near Eastern uh, uh, context, it was traditional and common for people of the same gender, when they greeted one another, to give a kiss on the cheek. In fact, it's still common in many parts of the world for this to be the case. I know my brother Scott, when he has traveled to Egypt, he's received a few kisses from men over there. Uh, and, and that's just the way it is. Now listen, if that's not your culture, it can be surprising. It can catch you a little bit off guard, all right? But in this culture, at this time, this was customary. Today, it's customary in the West to greet one another typically with a good handshake, right? That's how we greet one another. Uh, unless you're from the American South. If you're from the South, we hug one another. Everybody gets hugged. And if you're, if you're from up here and you go down and visit a church down South, you're going to get greeted with a hug, and it may surprise you, just as it surprises uh, my brother Scott when he gets kissed by a guy in Egypt, right? It, it, it's, whoa, wait a minute, I don't even know you. Why are you wrapping your arms around me? This is, this is weird, but that's, that's just the way it is. It's important for us to realize that the meaning of the kiss here, it's a cultural mannerism that represents a deeper truth. And what is that deeper truth? It's simply this. There needs to be a deep warmness towards one another in our Christian fellowship. In other words, we need to truly love one another. We need to love all the brothers and sisters in the church, even that person that gets on your last nerve. Now, I see a lot of you out there don't be sitting there acting like you love everybody in the church equally and that, that, that everybody in the church is easy to love. You know that's not true. You know that some people are easier to love than others. Yet God, through Paul, does not give us the option of only loving those who are easy to love. He tells us that we are to greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. We're to truly love one another every one of us, no matter how hard it is, that's what we need to do. Now, listen, this is hard. This isn't easy. And Paul is certainly not trying to say, get a drum circle and sing Kumbaya. That's not the kind of love, that superficial love, that, that doesn't really matter, it, because it isn't really true. 
That's not what he's calling for. He's calling for a true love for our brothers and sisters that goes beyond just whether or not we like them. And one of the greatest ways that we show our love to one another is by holding one another accountable and speaking the truth in love to one another. If you love someone and you see them rushing headlong into danger and into the danger of sin, it is not love to allow them to keep going. It is truly love to take them aside privately, privately, and counsel them and warn them and tell them the truth of Scripture and try to draw them back and let the Spirit work. So the fellowship that we share should be warm and loving, but I also want you to see the extent of the Christian fellowship. It's to all the brothers and sisters in the church. You know, sometimes we think that we have progressed so much as a society that we have progressed and, and we are so much better than we used to be. We lie to ourselves an awful lot, too. Because even today, even today, what is the most segregated time in America? It is the church hour. It's Sunday morning. We do, and you know why? Because this is voluntary. We have a choice where we go to church, and we often go to church with other people who look like us or talk like us. Uh, that's just the way it is. But that's not the way that it was in the early church. You see, in the early church, you had this mix of people. You had mix of people from different races and ethnicities. You had people who were from different socioeconomic uh, classes. You had people who looked different and talked different. And they were all coming together because just as Paul said, in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free. We can keep going, black or white, rich or poor. It, whatever the distinctions we want to draw are, they're gone in Christ. We are all one in Him. And that's a good thing. But even in Paul's day, there was a problem with preferential treatment. That's why James wrote about it. And he said, don't treat somebody who comes into your congregation who appears to be wealthy, don't treat them better than the person who's poor. Because that's not what Christ intends. That's not what he wants for us. We are to love everyone. And in the church, we have an opportunity to express to the world what the transformation of Christ does how it breaks down all of those barriers between individuals. Let me ask you a question this morning, church. Let's say next Sunday morning, a big, loud Harley Davidson motorcycle comes roaring up the driveway of the church. And on that big Harley Davidson motorcycle is an even bigger dude. All right. And he's got a long ponytail and that prototypical biker mustache and some scars and he's wearing leather, and he comes in the church, and he says, I want to worship with you guys. Let me ask you a question. Would you quickly shake his hand and point him somewhere? Or would you say, hey, come and sit with me. I'm so glad you're here. Come sit with me and my family. Well, okay, some of us may go, okay, I can do that. Now, let me ask you this. What if it was a homeless person, and they were really dirty, and they were really smelly, and they don't seem to be all there, would you do the same thing? Would you invite them in to worship, to hear the gospel? And let me take it a step farther. What if it's that person in the church that you just really can't get along with, who rubs you the wrong way? You see, we're called to greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. Now, I'm not asking this in an accusatory way as if this church has a problem with that. I don't believe it does. I've seen you welcome people in. I've seen you welcome homeless people in. I've seen you welcome all kinds of people in. But I want us to always be searching our heart because sin is deceitful and it is very easy for us to get into a position where we want to preferentially treat others. It can come without us even knowing it. So we need to remember 
the extent of Christian fellowship. It's all the brothers and sisters. We're to let our love sh be shown to one another in real and tangible ways. That's what the holy kiss was intended to do. It was an outward expression of an inward state of the heart. Brothers and sisters, we have to do this. It's a reminder to the Thessalonians and it's a reminder to us because it is so easy to allow wedges to be driven into the fellowship of the church. But the final gospel reminder I want you to see this morning that Paul offers is to study, and we see this expressed in verse 27. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. Paul had given this instruction for sharing his letter to other churches as well. If you look in Col uh, Colossians, you'll see him say the same thing here. So this is not an unusual command. But today, it does seem a little odd to hear somebody say, I want you to read my correspondence, all of it, to the whole church. That seems odd to us today. It, it, but we have to remember who it was that was writing this. It was Paul. He was an apostle of the church. But why would he issue this command? Is it because Paul's an authoritarian? Is it because he's so full of himself that he thinks everybody needs to hear what he has to say? No, it's neither one of these things. You see, the reason why Paul could issue this command is that there were two reasons for it. First, he had apostolic authority, and he also had the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He had both. So let's talk about those for just a moment. Apost what does it mean to be an apostle? That word is used in Scripture, right? Apostle. Well, in the Greek, apostle simply meant one who is sent out. And in the New Testament, it's used in a couple of different contexts. First, we think of those who hold the formal office of apostle. We think of the 11 disciples, minus Judas, of course, with the addition of Matthias and Paul. These are men who had the title of apostle. It was a formal title. It was a formal office in the early church. And they were given certain responsibilities and certain authority to serve the church as apostles. But there were certain criteria that had to be met in order to be considered an apostle. What were those criteria? Well, first of all, the people had to have seen the resurrected Christ. Not just known about him, but they had to have seen the resurrected Christ. All the original disciples, Paul, Matthias, all saw the resurrected Christ. So they met that criteria. Second, they had to be specifically commissioned by the Holy Spirit to go out as an apostle of the church. And again, these men met that criteria. And finally, the third requirement for, to hold the office of apostle is they had to be able to perform signs and wonders. Uh, that's one of the things that they did. And the reason for that is because God had created a new covenant with people, right? The new covenant through Jesus Christ, and it was going out, and it needed to have the signs and wonders to authenticate this, to say this is something that has come from God. This isn't just somebody's thoughts, somebody's new made-up religion. This is of God. And so the apostles had the authority and the ability to do signs and wonders, to heal people, to, uh, to do all kinds of things. And Paul and the others certainly did all of that. But that's the first context. The second context in which we see apostle used is just in those who were sent out to proclaim the gospel message. Today, we might think of them as missionaries. And there are a few in Scripture for whom this word is used. Barnabas is one of them. Uh, Junia, at the end of Romans, is another one. It's not that these people held the formal office of apostle, but rather that they were sent out to proclaim the gospel message. They had been given that charge to go. They weren't working signs and wonders. They weren't uh, necessarily selected by the Holy Spirit uh, to serve as an apostle. Because these people 
had the gift of the Holy Spirit uh, in this specific way, because they had been called by the Holy Spirit to perform these tasks, they also were used by the Holy Spirit. They were inspired by him to author the words of Scripture. In fact, that's one of the tests for knowing whether or not one of the writings of the New Testament was considered to be Scripture. Did you, one of the things that the church said has to happen is the person who wrote it had to be an apostle or they had to be a very close associate of one of the apostles. I'm, I'm talking about somebody like Luke or John Mark. Luke was a very close associate of Paul. John Mark was a very close associate of Peter. And those two wrote the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Luke, Acts, those, uh, those books of the Bible. So they had to be that very close associate, or they had to be one of the apostles themselves. But here's what happens. At the end of the first century, the very last apostle who is alive, John, he dies. He's the only one who was not martyred for the faith. He's the only one who lived to old age, and he died in Ephesus at the end of the first century. And when he died, the office of apostle closed. Why? Because the canon was closed. Scripture was complete. God had shared everything that he intended to share. He had revealed everything he intended to reveal in his word to us by that time. The faith had been established. The foundation had been built with Christ as the cornerstone. It had been laid by the apostles. Now, by the time of the second century AD, we're not building the foundation anymore. We're building on the foundation. So there's no need for the apostles anymore. But I have to tell you, I have to warn you, there is a movement, and it is a dangerous movement today, where there are some who are trying to reopen the office of apostle. And it's called the New Apostolic Reformation, or NAR for short. And these are people who want to put the title of apostle on themselves. You see, the original apostles, none of them took that title for themselves. It was conferred onto them by God. But folks today want to promote themselves to apostle. And let me tell you why they want to do that. They want to do that because they know the authority that the office of apostle has over the church and in the church, and they want it for themselves. They want their authority to be on par with the original apostles and with Scripture. That is dangerous, and that is not appropriate for today. That is, the church has what it needs in the sufficient and inerrant Word of God. There is no need for apostles to speak to us anymore. In fact, Paul would warn us in 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen about these kind of people. He said, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. It was happening in Paul's day. It is happening in our day as well. So I have just a real simple piece of advice for you. If you should ever hear somebody who introduces themselves as apostle so-and-so, here's your word of advice. Run. Get out of there. Don't listen. Don't, don't tolerate it. Don't even give it the appearance that you're okay with it. Run from it. Have nothing to do with them. For they are false apostles, deceitful workmen, and they're disguising themselves. But Paul, Paul was an apostle of the Lord. Paul was sent out by Jesus Christ himself to be the apostle to the Gentiles, and he was inspired by the Holy Spirit, which meant he had the authority to charge the Thessalonians to read the letter in the church to all the brothers. He had that kind of authority. I don't want you to miss this aspect of who the letter was to be written to. It was to be written to the, it, it was to be read to the entire gathering of believers in Thessalonica. It was not necessarily to just be read individually, although it could be, but there was a need for it to be read to the church as a whole. You see, Paul's saying, come together as the body, read and study what I have written here, because what I have sent you is from the Lord. It is his inspired work. Paul understood this. That's it. There's an important aspect of, of the proclaimed word and the study of the word 
it's important for it to be done in the body, the corporate gathering of the church. And that's why the Reformation returned the central focus of the worship service to the preaching of the word. That had to be central. That had to be the most important thing because that is the word of God to us today. And that's why Paul would say, I put you under oath before the Lord. This is a strong command. This is an incredible, some translations have it, I charge you. I put you under oath before the Lord. Do this. He understood. It wasn't an authoritarian command that was issued from a place of pride. It was a command given because he understood just how important God's word was for his people. The great evangelist George Whitfield, who some have, and I think rightly described, as America's spiritual founding father, George Whitfield, that great evangelist who traveled all through the United States preaching the word of God in that first great awakening in the 1700s, uh, he was such a, a tremendous preacher that there was an actor who said that he would give any amount of money if he could just say, oh, like George Whitfield. And another person said that, that George Whitfield could move an entire congregation of people to tears just by pronouncing the word Mesopotamia. I have not been able to do that yet, but George Whitfield could. And this one particular time, Whitfield was preaching in a church, and it was a rainy Sunday, and he was moving kind of slow, and the folks were seeming a little detached. And there was an old man who was sitting right down on the front pew of the church, right below the pulpit, and he fell asleep. And Whitfield noticed this, and he stopped, and his countenance changed, and his tone changed, and he said, if I had come here to speak to you in my own name, you might well rest your knees on your, your, your uh, elbows on your knees and your head in your hands and sleep. And once in a while, look up and say, what is this babbler talking of? But I have not come to you in my own name. No, I have come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, and I must be heard. And I will be heard. Well, that church started, and the old man woke up, and Whitfield looked him square in the eye, and he said, I have waked you up, have I? I meant to do it. I am not come here to preach to stocks and stones. I have come to you in the name of the Lord God of hosts, and I must and will have an audience. You see, whenever the word of God is preached, it must and it will have an audience. Friends, we must give attention and study to the word as it deserves. But finally, after I knock this off, Finally, I want you to see how Paul calls on the Thessalonians to read and study the fullness of the letter that he is sending them. As we've seen throughout the study of Thessalonians here, there's a tremendous amount of instruction and nourishment for the body of Christ, isn't there? I mean, we have been in this book for uh, a few months now. We've been in it since April, and we have been seeing just how much this book has for us. You see, if we were just to skim through this book and only land on the sections that give us warm and fuzzy feelings, we'd actually be missing out on the whole counsel of God that he has in the fullness of this letter for not only the Thessalonian believers, but for us as well. It's as applicable to us today as it was to them. And that's why I believe that there is a necessity for expository preaching in the church. I believe that we must be going verse by verse through Scripture and through the wholeness of Scripture. Now, that's not to say that it isn't right and it isn't good to occasionally have some topical studies where we look at specific things. Those are important for the church, too. But the main diet for the church must be expository preaching, going through the fullness of books of Scripture so that we can see the whole counsel of God for us. Because I can tell you right now, there's a lot of places I'd love to skip over. I'm just being honest with you. Because they're hard. They're hard for me to hear. 
and they're hard for me to preach. But God didn't say only preach the easy parts. He didn't say only study the easy parts. Put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers, all of it. When we do this, we receive the meat of Scripture, and it gives us the nourishment we need to grow stronger and more mature in our faith. That through the richness of the Word of God, we better see His majesty and His awesomeness, His holiness and His righteousness and His love and His grace. And where is the best part to see His love and grace? It's in the person of Jesus Christ. It's in Him. It's in His completed work on the cross for you and me. It's in the victory over sin and death in the resurrection. It's in the hope that we have of His return when He comes to judge the living and the dead. That is what we have, brothers and sisters, and that is what Paul was communicating not only to the Thessalonians, but to us as well. And so this morning I pray that these gospel reminders stick with you. Not just now, not just this week, but for the rest of your lives, so long as Jesus should tarry. That these would be like those little stones that Oz Guinness kept in each one of his pockets. That you remember these things. That you remember to pray and to love and to study. But I have to tell you too, that this morning, Jesus is coming back. That great hope that Paul talked about in Thessalonians, Jesus is coming back. And if you wait until then to make a decision for him, it is too late. There is no chance at that point. Your fate will be decided, and it is not a fate that you want. If you wait until then, your fate is to receive eternal punishment in hell because of your sin. And so this morning, as we close with a final hymn, I'm going to be right down here. And if you want to come and, and, and talk to me about Jesus and to hear about what it means to be saved by His grace through faith alone, I want to tell you about that. The gift is free from God. We need to receive it. And so I'll be right down here to talk to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. We thank you for this book of 1 Thessalonians that we have completed. Father, we thank you that it has so much to teach us about prayer and about love and about studying your word. Father, we thank you how it points us to holiness, but it also gives us the hope that we have in Jesus, that our holiness is in him. His righteousness has been imputed to us. But Father, I also thank you for the hope that we have that whether we face death or Christ's return, that our hope is in Christ. And it is a secure hope. It is a firm hope. It is a hope that cannot be shaken because you will not leave or forsake us. You will not give us up. You hold us in your mighty hand and no one can take us out of it. Father, we ask you this morning if there is anyone here who doesn't know that salvation, who doesn't have that hope, that, Father, you would not allow them to leave here without coming down and talking to me and knowing what it means to place their faith in Christ for their salvation. We ask this in his powerful and mighty name, the only name under heaven by which men may be saved. Amen.